Howdy, howdy, everyone. Welcome to the I Read It for the Plot podcast. Now, before we begin today's episode, I would like to send a massive shout out to everyone who has joined us in the Discord. Welcome. I am so happy you're all here. I have really been enjoying the book the book suggestions and discussions seen in the channels. And speaking of discussions, I have a very special guest with me today. You know her. You love her. She's a professional actor, social media influencer, fellow podcaster, cameo star, and a most beloved friend, Sammy DeSocio! Yo. How you doing? How you doing? Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's the most Jersey thing I've ever heard you say. <laughs> ah! <laughs> And I, my my dumbass just reacted automatically, and my brain went, "Wait a minute! Wait a minute! She's from California! Wait a minute! <laughs> How does she know our secret yeah. language? Wait! <laughs> I grew up in Mel Brooks. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, well, wait, wait. He was from Brooklyn. Yeah, no, that tracks. Yeah. yeah. But still, like, I grew up on that accent, and that's, like, my go-to overly sarcastic accent. Nice. If I ever, if, oh, God, there's a mutual friend of ours, and uh -huh. I remember I used to send them an affirmation, and I would start it off with, hey, you, yeah, you, <laughs> what do you think you're doing, huh? Are you having a good day? Good. You better be having a good day. Oh, my God, I love it. Oh, yeah. my God, I love it. Oh, that's how I sent them affirmations or daily encouragements for the longest time. I should do that again. I miss those. I miss doing that voice. Oh, boy. Yeah. Just for fun. Just for kicks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tammy, thank you yes. for joining me today. I really appreciate you coming on. You of have course. Been you have been my rock since even the thought process <laughs> of even be thinking about starting this podcast. Oh, thank you. You're you're yeah. awesome. I love this. I love you. Thank you so much. Love you too. Aw. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so, to begin today's episode, you told me something about yourself recently. Uh, that you were rather a, um, a late bloomer reader, or a late, uh, god damn it, I forgot it again! You're the good. Name, the publishing company name with the word bloom in it! I cannot Blooms with all that- Bloomsbury, dear. Bloomsbury, you're late. Bloomersbury is no, still doesn't. Matter. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? We're quickly falling apart here, Aaron. <laughs> I tried to make a pun, but it was too, it was too shitty. It was... <laughs> <laughs> okay. <sighs> yeah, no, we'll, we'll just forget about that one. Anyways, so have you got your cup? Mm-hmm. Have you got your blanket? Mm-hmm. Great. Let's talk books. Yes. All right. So, like I said earlier, you are a late bloomer reader. Mm hmm. All right. So, how did you get into reading? Like, what was the first series that you really delved into and why? So, the first series that I got into, like, as a kid, was a series called Daughters of the Moon. And I can't even remember, like, the entire plot line of it. Um, but I lost interest in it around book five. Um, oh, how? Yeah. What happened? It just was such a slow, slow progression. We didn't even get to the point until the fifth book. Like um, Sarah J. Mass slow, or like... No, like, like snail's pace, molasses in the winter slow. Oh my god. Yeah, it was... Mm. Um, and then more recently, in the past few years... Um, a mutual friend of ours got me into the A Court of, Ro a Court of Thorns and Roses series, Akatar. Yeah. And I remember, and I, I met our friend, you know, through social media, and I remember watching a live that they did, and everybody, and I was fairly new to the group, and everybody kept saying, oh, Akatar, and Akatar this, Akatar that. And I very meekly put in the chat, are you guys all misspelling actor? <laughs> what? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And our mutual friend looked at my comment, laughed, and said, Google a court of thorns and roses. And I looked at the t- and I listened to the title and I went, A C T Oh, Akatar. I get it. <laughs> it was an acronym. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all, are you all spelling actor wrong? <laughs> um, so once I found out what it was, I literally dove headfirst into that series and kind of never looked back. <laughs> Tends to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Quickly, too. How long did it take you to realize that it was a... A fantasy retelling of Beauty and the Beast. Middle of chapter one. <laughs> Middle of chapter one, when he bursts through the... Spoiler alert for those that haven't picked this book up yet. Um, Get out of the West Wing! <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. When, uh, when Tamlin bursts through her front door in full beast mode. And I went, ah, uh, I've seen this movie. Okay. <laughs> I've seen this movie before. Okie dokie. This will be fun. <laughs> For me, it was when they were entering the spring court. Oh, and yeah, I, I could saw, see that. It was the whole vision of like the mansion or the castle, whatever. I was like, oh. Yeah, okay. and like the one servant in the house that wants to help her. Like, it this follows sucks. kind of the same pattern. Yeah. Yeah. And do you know how, how happy I was when I realized that Lucian is Lumiere? Oh, wait, what? Wait, what? Did you know that? Did you pick up on that? No, what? <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought Lucian's only function was to, like, put his hand over Tamlin's mouth and goes, that's an inside thought, my guy. Like, <laughs> no, Lucian is Lumiere. He's literally the wingman. Then who's Cogsworth? Is there no Cogsworth? Did we miss a character? No, but Alice is obviously Mrs. Potts. Oh my gosh, yes, that I could tell you. That I could tell you. No, I think that Lucian is part Lumiere and part Cogsworth. Because Cogsworth would smack his hand over the beast's mouth and go, that's an inside thought, dude. You can't say that to people. That's not nice. (laughs) Meanwhile, Lumiere's just in the corner laughing at him. So that, yeah, I think Lucian's both. (laughs) I can see it, yeah. Right? (laughs) Depending on the situation, either he just laughs at him and goes, dude, that's an inside thought. You can't say that to people. Uh, How far have you gotten into the series? I am on book three. Only book three. Hmm. I know. Sometimes, here's the thing, though, that, like, life kind of intervened while I was reading. So sometimes you have to deal with life a little bit. (laughs) Fair. Wait, what are you reading right now? Right now, I'm reading... Oh, what's the name of the book you told me to read that you... Oh, oh, uh, Ruin and Wrath. That one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I told. I think I've told you before that that just one interaction scene in that book puts chapter 55 to shame. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it, it, it makes it look, in terms of spiciness, mm-hmm. it makes it look like a, um, a bell pepper... In comparison oh to a red hot chili pepper. Oh dear, I can't wait. Yeah, I finished yeah. the pro. I finished the prologue, so I'm excited to like get into the story now. Yeah, there's only one thing I don't like about how that book started. And spoiler alert for anyone who has not yet read it, I don't. It's I don't like this trope where the main character is a young, is much younger when they first meet, and then they meet right. again years again later. Um, it's spoiler alert, but. Mm-hmm that whole trope where she starts out very young and in his mind or she should still be a child when they first met and right. in some way he still sees her as a child so that kind of plays on some kind of like ick factor yeah yeah but in any case that was just my personal opinion to mm-hmm. each their own mm-hmm. but i seriously i recommend this book to any spicy book readers i it does it doesn't even need a plot <laughs> it doesn't even need a plot. It's actually a really fun read, though. Yeah. So yeah. far, it's so far it's good. Yeah. Anyways, so uh, back to the podcast. Uh, yes. So you've gotten about a little over halfway through uh, Akatar series. Yes. 
Um, what is a book that you have read that you could not put down? Oh, there's been a couple. Uh, my number one answer will always be The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. Always. Oh, classic. I love this book. And here's the thing. I don't even know why I love this book. Like, I just love the book. It's such a great story. And mm-hmm. then I know, I know nine times out of ten when they do movies based on books, the movies really miss the mark. Oh, a yeah. lot. Oh yeah. The movie of the Outsiders is literally almost page for page the book. They literally didn't miss anything. They took lines right from the book and put it in the movie. Brilliant. And I absolutely love that. Yeah, and the author was actually in the movie too, which made it even better. They made a cameo, didn't they? Yeah, she did. She, if you guys are familiar with the movie The Outsiders, the scene where Dally, I always have to think this one through. Um, Mm -hmm. When Dally is in the hospital, S.E. Hinton, who wrote the book, plays his nurse that told, that tells him he's not allowed to smoke in the hospital. Oh. That's her. Um, So that book and Little Women. Um, my mom gave me a copy when I was a kid because uh, the movie when I was a kid had just come out with Winona Ryder and uh, Susan Sarandon and um, a Christian very Bale. and Christian Bale, very young Christian Bale. Um, so she bought me a copy of the book with the and the front of the book has a picture of the five women that starred in the movie on the book cover. I say five because it was the four sisters and their mom. Um, it had a picture of the five women that they cast in the movie. And in the, in the book had production stills of the movie too. Um, and I read that book so many times. I still have it, but I can no longer open it because when I do pages fall out. Oh, is how many times I've read. Yeah. I completely, I destroyed the spine. Oh, Sammy. From the amount of times I read this book, I destroyed the spine. (laughs) Like, there is no more spine to speak of. The only reason I know what book it is is because I still have the front cover. (laughs) (laughs) The only reason I know what book it is. (laughs) Oh, Sammy. At this point, I think the pages are even out of order for the amount of times I've had to pick pages up and just put them back. You've demolished that poor book. (laughs) I did, but wait, it's a well-loved book. Mm, very true, yeah. Very it true. is a very well-loved book. I just was not the most gentle of kids. <laughs> the One of the books that I could not put down, and it doesn't have any fantasy in it, but it is a tragic romance, it's Me Before You. Mm-hmm. It's just a beautifully written story, and I honestly resonated so much to the or with the main character, um... God, Amelia. Or no, wait. Yeah, no, Louise. Because I'm thinking of the actress. Her name is it's Amelia Clark. Well, she had the same last name as the character, that's why. Oh, her char- okay. Yeah, her character's name is Louise Clark, and then it's Amelia Clark that plays her in the movie. And she loved that book so much, she practically begged, I think she did not begged, but she insisted on being like the, uh, playing the main character. She does such a beautiful job of it. Nice. Yeah, and that is definitely what I would consider one of the movies that based on a book that actually came closest to the book it was based on. Mm-hmm. They, they only left out like one it, one thing about her backstory that didn't fit the vibe of the movie, and that was mm-hmm. understandably so. But I highly recommend this book to anyone who even just needs like a good homie, almost even um, a rom-com, but sad, tragic romance. <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. There you go. And then the other book that I can't put down is literally anything that Edgar Allan Poe ever wrote. Yes. Oh. Like oh, when I was in the seventh grade, I memorized a good chunk of The Raven, The Cask of Amontillado, and mm-hmm. The Black Cat. Nice. Literally, me- and that was for fun. That was not a school assignment. That was for fun I memorized these things. I loved memorizing um, not just stuff for theater, but for poems and um, 
for substitute English assignments, I remember I was in junior high, and one of our assigned readings was poems from the Canterbury Tales. Oh. Yeah, and Ooh. I actually memorized and performed in costume, nice. bent over like the hunchback character, Saint <laughs> Saint Winifred's Well. Oh, awesome! Yeah. I dressed up in costume oh, that's as the awesome. character, and oh, I remember that's awesome. all my my classmates weren't even shocked because this was a typical thing for me. Yeah, yeah, I was, when, I was that kid. Yeah, junior was it junior year? Seen? Who did I have senior year? It had to have been senior year. Senior year, we read the Canterbury Tales, mm -hmm. and I my section to perform or to do a report on was the Wife of Bath. Oh. And at the time, I had this really obnoxiously orange dress, okay. and um. I had this really obnoxious orange dress. I had this really floppy hat. I had like the most obnoxious costume you could probably come up with um, for this character. And Do you have pictures? Do I, you have photo evidence? I don't because it was for class. Oh. And there were no pictures taken in class. <laughs> so, because it was... Now, boys and girls, this was before the time of the camera phone. Oh, God. Yeah, I graduated high school in 2005. Oh, so I, was it was, I was seven years behind you then. Yeah, it was far before phones had the capabilities of taking pictures. So, there are no pictures of this. Do you remember when you had to pay for text messages? Yes, like 10 cents text? a text message. 10 cents oh. a text message. Yeah. Or how about when the phone started to be able to go online and it was 99 cents a minute? Mm hmm. And Lord help you if you accidentally logged online. Oh, God. Close the browser! Close the browser! <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I remember I flipped out when I got my first flip phone. Like the kind that shifted, like had a little keyboard. Oh, the Razor phone. I had one of yeah. those. I had the orange one. Oh god, we're aging ourselves on this podcast. We <laughs> are. Oh my gosh. The more I say, the more my brain is like, be quiet. People are going to figure it out. <laughs> we're supposed to talk about books. I know. <laughs> okay, so back to books. Um, back to books. Yeah, books that you could not put down. Um, Me Before You was one of mine. Yours was Outsiders and Little Women. I could not put down... Princess Bride when I was reading it for a school assignment. That was my Ooh. that was one of the only enjoyable assigned readings. I read that book three times in one week, but mostly because I kind of skipped over the parts where it was the grandfather and the grandson. Right. I read it for the fantasy, okay? <laughs> Let's be honest with each other now. Yeah, honesty is the best policy. So Absolutely. But come on, how could you not? I mean, I actually fell in love with Wesley. Even when he was a dick in the book. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, not my standard nowadays. Definitely not. Carrie Elvis? Oh. If... Damn, that man. Oh, I know. He was my first childhood uh, celebrity crush. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. And as oh Wesley, he was just... He was perfect. Love it. But... Yeah, no, Wesley from the books was an ass. And I remember for like, um, I fell in love with like pre-Pirate Wesley because mm -hmm. post -pi because Pirate Wesley was the ass. Um, right. Pre-Pirate Wesley was a love-struck, romantic, sweet, kind, loving boy. Mm -hmm. And then um, he turns into an asshole when he becomes a pirate, which is understandably so because you know all the uh, learning how to uh, survival fight for right. survival and all that. Right. But in the books, he actually hits her. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Like that part where he says, that was a warning, your highness, when she says, like, I love more deeply than a killer like you could ever uh, dream. Right. And he holds his hand up and then she flinches and he says, that was a warning. Oh. Uh, a trigger warning. My apologies for anyone who, um, uh, who, ha who doesn't know this or, and spoiler alert. But, yeah. um, he says that was a warning, but in the books, he actually does smack her. Oh. Yeah. Oh, and he said that terrible. was a warning. That was oh, a warning. That was that was the mm. Yeah. 
Mm. So, yeah, still one of my favorite movies growing up, still one of my favorite right. stories, but Wesley was not the reason. Uh, certainly not after that. I was more invested in Enigma Montoya. Oh, of course. He was, like, brilliantly loved, a brilliant character. Um, oh, just tore my heart apart when I was reading his backstory in that story. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and I cannot express enough to you how much Mandy Patinkin loves mm. that role. Yes. Loves that. Loves the fact that people can still, to this day, quote that movie to him. And he remembers his lines and stuff, too. <laughs> oh, I still say, hello, my name is Enrico Montoya. <laughs> you killed my father. Prepare to Prepare die. To die. <laughs> Classic. Yes. I, was, I flipped out when I saw him in Criminal Minds. Oh my goodness, he has a new As show Gideon. coming out now. Yeah, another murder one, but he has an English accent in this one. Oh gosh. I love, I love this man. I yes, love this man. so much. Brilliant. Okay, back to books. Yes. Anyway, books. Th- for those <laughs> listening, this is this is going to keep happening. We're just going to, our brains are going to go on little adventures while we're talking little side quests. Yeah. This is a normal conversation for us. This this is. This is a normal conversation for any of us, let's be honest. <laughs> All right, so we covered Akatar. We covered yes. books we could not put down. Yes. Ooh, I, I okay. did kind of introduce this one. Um, who is a fictional character that you have fallen in love with? Geralt. Geralt of Rivia. I highly approve of this. <laughs> Geralt. If you invite me to your wedding, okay? <laughs> you got it, boss. <laughs> um, there are many reasons for this. Yeah. First, Henry Cavill. Just putting, <laughs> putting it out there. Henry Cavill. Um, beyond that, though, like, Geralt as, an, as a character... Phenomenal. is so fascinating to me because look this man's honor this man's i don't want to call it sick pride because you find out later on he's not the only witcher at the beginning of the series you kind i've never read the books i have one of the books i've never read the books mm-hmm. um but apparently the netflix series was very very close to the books mm-hmm. um so at the beginning of the series, you're kind of led to believe that he's the last one. You know, that's kind of the gist of, of the first season is that, you know, he's the last of the dying breed of witchers. Um, you find out in the second season that's not true. There's a whole bunch of them left and they all convene at one spot. Um, but when he he does a favor there's three main four main characters in the series there's Geralt there's Yennefer Yasker and Ciri and Ciri is a child Ciri is only supposed to be I think 13 Mm -hmm. 14 somewhere around there Um, and then the second season she's about 16 somewhere around there Mm -hmm. and he obtains Ciri through what is called the child surprise he does a favor for her grandmother and he well, asked. He saved her father's life. He saved her father's life. Okay, that's what it was. That part of the series was a little fuzzy to me. I was like, what just happened? Um, he saved Siri's father's life. And so his her grandmother says, I will grant you a wish. I'll do you a favor. And he goes, I want my child. I want a child surprise. And he essentially asks for Siri. He doesn't realize that that's who he's asking for, but he asks for Siri. Um, and then he spends the entire first season essentially looking for her while doing these little side quests. Um, no matter what trouble Yasker gets himself into, and I swear that that character has the brain of an amoeba sometimes. (laughs) Has the attention span and the brain of an amoeba sometimes. You gotta love Yasker. You really, really do. (laughs) Sometimes he opens his mouth and even Geralt looks at him and goes, did you hear you? (laughs) Because we all hear you and you sound like an idiot right now. (laughs) Gotta love the comic relief character. Oh my gosh. They have a very Shrek and Donkey relationship. Oh my god, they do! They do. They have a very Shrek and Donkey relationship. It's actually kind of funny. Um, 
Oh god, so, he even sings like Donkey. He does. So, but no matter what trouble Yasker gets himself into, no matter what trouble Yennefer gets herself into, he is always right there to defend them. At the end of the day, he really does love Yennefer, no matter what the heck this crazy woman does. He will always stand for Yennefer. He will always protect her in whatever capacity he can. Well, he doesn't need to protect her, but he'll always back her up. Right. He'll back her up. He is always there. Uh, When she gets in trouble, he's right behind her. And then, spoiler alert for those that haven't seen it, in season two, you start meeting Geralt's friends. Because in the first season, again, he is the lone white wolf. There are no more witches as far as anybody is concerned. He wanders the planet by himself, and then he kind of picks up Yasker along the way. (laughs) (laughs) Um... But in the second season, you start... He even starts out in a swamp! He does. That very first scene, he's in a swamp. (laughs) Anyway. I'll never be able to unsee this now. (laughs) I know you won't. I know you won't. Go ahead. So, that's okay. So in the second season, you start seeing his interactions with people that he knew before his child surprise. You see him interacting with the other witchers. You see him interacting with a long, with a long-standing friend of his. Um, and in both cases, you find out that these people that were his friends have either turned, and they're now the monsters that he chases, or one of them gets attacked by one of the monsters that he chases and turns into one himself. And you watch Geralt not even bat an eyelash when he knows what he has to do and, you know, dispatches with both of them. Mm -hmm. Because he has no choice. Because at the end of the day, he's a monster hunter, and these two are now classified as monsters. Forget the long-standing relationship that he might have with them. He does what he knows he has to do. And that takes, like, the amount of courage and honor that that takes for somebody to be able to do that. And not even bat an eye about it. Literally does it, goes and has a beer. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't even settle on him that he just dispatched of one of his long-standing friends. It was, I just killed a monster. He compartmentalizes. Is a a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but still fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So I love him as a character. I think that he is fantastic. And I love Henry Cavill for the role because this man literally lives Geralt. Mm -hmm. He asked his agent for the interview. He begged his agent for the interview. He's beaten the game more than once on hard. He read the entire series more than once Mm -hmm. you know so this is a man that literally was waiting like give him an excuse to play this role was waiting for this role to happen for him and get him out of the superman because that that was going nowhere oh my gosh um and he did such a phenomenal job with it yeah so that's that's why i have i have completely completely fallen for Geralt. Yeah. Yeah. I can see it. I can absolutely see it. Mm Mm-hmm. I've fallen in love with a few fictional characters in my time. Um, I'm not a, again, I'm not going into detail about my Twilight phase. Right. Yeah. Yeah, not yet. I may do an entire episode on it because it's going to take that long to just, to go into detail about it. (laughs) (sighs) But, uh, (laughs) The best of them that I think I fell for um, was like was the I think I'm not even fallen for, but he was my, definitely my favorite character was Harry Dresden from the Dresden Files. Ah, yeah, just this badass, hilarious, dark humored character. Oh my gosh, and, I love it. Like I said, I've described the series as it's like Harry Potter, mm-hmm. but American and rated R. Oh, yeah, like, love like if, it. Like, imagine if a tame version of Deadpool 
was Harry Potter. Oh my gosh, I love it. It's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. Like, okay, uh, minor spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, I think I've told this part before, where he's literally jumping into a mid- the middle of a battle between uh, Summer and Winter Fay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love the author. He incorporates a lot of, like, multicultural mythologies into, like, even just a couple of books. But, mm-hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. He jumps into the ma- uh, middle of a fey battle, and mm-hmm. he and his friends see that uh, a group of soldiers are charging them. They're mm-hmm. coming at them, and then all of his friends start doing their battle cry, like, ah! And then <laughs> Harry, this sarcastic, brilliant motherfucker, he stands his ground and starts shouting, I don't believe in fairies! <laughs> <laughs> Harry Dresden! Yeah! Harry Dresden, do not make me tell Bob. <laughs> oh, Bob is the reason you should read the series. <laughs> oh my god, I, oh my god, yes! Bob the Skull, everyone! <laughs> yes! Just... Oh my god, the freaking love potion with Susan! <laughs> Oh my gosh, okay. I can't wait to read this series. Oh, you have to. It's, oh my gosh, I can't wait. Yeah. Uh, either that or listen to the audiobooks. The audiobooks, funnily enough, or greatly enough, are actually read by the guy who plays Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Okay, I need to buy the audiobooks like tomorrow. Yes. But yes. Uh, uh, also, another interesting fact um, Spike's not British. That's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't get to hear it in his... When you Okay, here's the thing. When you look back at Spike, when you listen to Buffy now, after learning he's actually American, you can hear the fakeness in the accent. Mm. Just how bad of a fake British accent it really is. Oh my gosh, there was another actor on, uh, on Angel that was like that too. I can never remember his name. Is it the Irish guy? Yeah. Oh yeah. And... Before he did Angel, he played Mark on Roseanne, and that was what, where I first saw him. Uh-huh. And so, after seeing him on Angel and hearing his actual voice, I would go back and watch reruns of Roseanne, and I'd listen to him speak in, you know, American. <laughs> I, I forget where they're supposed to be from. I forget where they're supposed to be from. Um, where are they from? We can this look it gonna, up later. Yeah, this is gonna... Yeah. I can't remember where where Roseanne's family was supposed to live. Anyone Illinois. I want to say it was oh. Illinois. Audience members, if you're listening to this and you know the answer immediately, drop it in the comment section or in the Discord. Yeah, I think yeah. it was Illinois because they reference one of the characters going to Chicago a lot. Um... That being said, so, back to the podcast. Back to the that, yeah, that being said, so he's so they're supposed to be this all American family living in Illinois. Mm-hmm. And after watching Angel, whenever he would open his mouth for Illinois to come out, I would hear the very su- the very subtle undertone of his accent. Oh. And I would just sit there looking at the TV going, Well, I don't believe this anymore. <laughs> I know what you actually sound like now. <laughs> you do a decent job of hiding it, but I, I can still hear it. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's see. Fictional characters we've also fallen in love with. Fell head over heels in love with Angel. I'm oh. sorry, but that... Oh, oh David Boreanaz. Yeah, especially yeah. in Bones. Booth mm-hmm. is fucking hilarious. Oh my god, I love Booth so much. Yeah. <laughs> he puts That's... up with nothing. <laughs> yeah. Crime show characters wise, uh, Reed from Criminal Minds. Absolutely mm-hmm. loved Reed. Um, mm-hmm. Let's see. There was a. Okay, when I started reading Young Adult, I remember I fell in love with the fictional man from that story. His name was Gabriel Duval. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, definitely one of those annoying um, uh, guy, uh, guys that tries to uh, control the main character in some way, shape, or form. But he realizes mm-hmm. that he can't. But he can, he can't. But he respects that. But it's, it's it is your typical enemies to lovers trope. 
Right. But God, he was fucking sarcastic. Oh I my God, I love yeah. it. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be completely honest. Um, I never fell in love with Reese, Reese Ann from the Avatar series. He annoyed the fuck out of me. Okay. But I fucking love Cassian. That's I... sarcastic. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, but Cassian and Lucian, I love those characters. The sarcastic friend character. The ones that are, like, they know their shit, but they're goofy as hell, and they always have the best dialogue. I mean, I, I was like, what the hell is she doing with Tamlin? I mean, I immediately, when I read Lucian, I was like, oh, I like this guy. Oh, I yeah. like this guy. Because even read, Lucian's looking at Tamlin going, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Why are you doing this? And then, What's the purpose of this? Meeting Cassian, hearing his humor, his personality. I actually imagined him as a ginger when I first read him. I don't know why. Huh. He's got a ginger personality. Huh, he does. I can see it. Yeah. But anyways, so... Anyways, <laughs> just that mischievous... Yes. I love the mischievous, fun characters like that. Oh, yeah. And... No, he's just got um, a great sense of loyalty, mm -hmm. and he's such a good, great heart. But again, he, and he's a badass. But again, yeah. I just love the characters that have the best sense of humor, mm -hmm. and those are the kind of people that I'm even, you know, drawn to in real life. The people, if you have a great sense of humor, I'm there with you right there. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, and but no, Cassie and I definitely preferred to Reese because Reese could be such a creepy asshat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyways, um, I apologize to any Akatar fans who are, like, gr grilling me right now, but you know what? I'm sorry. Cassian's better than Reese. My opinion. <laughs> and, uh, if you haven't read Silver Flames yet, you'll see exactly why. Nice. Yeah. I'm going- I, my- my goal is to get through all of them before I go on my trip. <laughs> yes. Okay, so... In terms of, like, uh, keeping to the subject of... We're trying to stay on subject. <laughs> we're not going to stay on the subject. We go on side quests, and it's okay. What's the it's next okay. question? <laughs> I'm not procrastinating. I'm no. uh, I'm doing a side quest. That's right. Side quest. Okay. So, but uh, back to the subject of the podcast... Uh, in, of the podcast in general. Like, it's mostly about spicy books and romances, but... What is your personal favorite writing trope, or even what is your personal favorite um, romantic subplot uh, subplot trope? Oh, we did this the other day. Yeah. Okay. Like I. What did we What did we land on? We landed on a it, bunch because we just read off a list. No, wasn't it like friend enemies to lovers to friends or something like that? Friends to lovers to friends. Uh, that sounds like the intro to someone else's podcast. <laughs> I see what I did there. Yeah. I can't I can't Copyright. That's not what I meant to do. That's not what I meant to do. No, what's what's that trope? You and I figured this out the other day. I don't know, but I brought I I found the list again. Well, no, cuz it was cuz I said that I wanted to be really basic and be like enemies to lovers and you said there's another one like enemies to lovers to friends or something like that it's friend it's uh or enemies to friends to lovers that's the one i like yeah that's the one i like i mentioned that in my first podcast episode or or no it's the last one that i did where i was like describing the relationship between aelin and rowan okay yeah because I love those. I like when they build a friendship first mm -hmm. um, from an enemies to lovers relationship because that's how I feel like you build the most trust. Right. You know? Especially in that relationship. But um, mm -hmm. other than that, um, yeah, what what kind of... you? That was your favorite type of trope? Where it's yeah. um, enemies to friends to lovers? Yeah. I guess in a way... Um, Reese and Feyre are also a good example of that because they did become friends uh, before they got down to anything, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And... Yeah, let's see. Who else? And they did, did technically start as enemies because Tamlin kind of put that in her head. Reese was never her enemy. He I, never I know that, th but it was perceived that he was. Mm -hmm. Because the only so, exposure yeah. that she had to him was the creepy guy that tried to flirt with her at the bonfire. 
Well, that was their first impression, and then he was even creepier under the mountain. But at least he helped her under the mountain. He's the reason she survived under the mountain. Yeah, but he did a really shitty thing in order to he do it. He did. Yeah, he did. I'm sorry, but that I, I draw a line at that. I know. Yeah. And I'm sorry, like, here's the thing, like, side quest real quick. Mm -hmm. Did did anybody else listening out there that read A Court of Thorns and Roses, when she fights the worm, did anybody else have that episode of Spongebob running through their head? <laughs> 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 the Alaskan <laughs> Bullworm! A few people on oh, TikTok that's, did. <laughs> that's the tongue. <laughs> and the whole thing is the worm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that's all I could think about while I was reading <laughs> part of the book. Even before the TikTok trend started amongst the Akatar community. I was... When I was reading that book the first time, that's all I could keep thinking of. It was a combination of that and the Garthak from Coneheads. That's what I kept thinking. Oh my god. I was thinking of like the, the um, oh what is it? The worms from Dune. Oh my gosh! See, my yeah. brain didn't go to Dune. Well, that was like the the mental um, the mental image I had in my head because I'd already seen uh, two versions of well not no I've only seen one version of Dune the old TV show version. I haven't seen the new one with the Tim Timothy Chalamet. Don't come at me, okay? <laughs> but um. Yeah, no, I've had that image inside my head of that, and I also, um... It's also reminded me of the scene from the of the Rancor from Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Yes! yes. Oh, I forgot about that part, you're right. It's literally, she literally drops her in, just like Luke! Look, and then the gate like, raises! There's just... so many of the Star Wars movies out now. Yeah. It's been a long time since I saw the original trilogy. Yeah. But you know, that's, that whole bit was actually based yes. on the Greek myth of uh, Psyche and Eros, because it was, um, Amarantha is Aphrodite, uh -huh. and Aphrodite made a deal with Psyche that if she could complete three impossible tasks, then she'll help her reunite with her love, which was um, Psyche's adopted son, Eros. Oh, or not okay. Psyche's, uh, Aphrodite's adopted son, Eros. Oh, okay. Yeah. Eros was never Aphrodite's son. Never oh. biologically. She adopted him. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, now when the Olympians came into power, that's how they, that's how they took power. They, um, they made themselves, like, parental figures of all the other gods, even the ones that were there long before them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotta love politics. <laughs> oh, you gotta love it. Anyways, um, so, yeah, that was based on the Greek myth of Psyche and Eros to the, um, to very last, almost very few details. Um, but, and just like in the original myth, uh, Feyre had help with almost each and every mission. Right. Yeah. I um, mean, she didn't have as, as much help as um, with the worm, but she had help in the second and last tasks as well. Yes. Yeah. Anyways, so back yes. to um, back to bu back to book tropes. Yes. So we have a few that we read off a list just the other day. Um, the first one, and this is the first two are just or the first three. Basically, Harry Potter. First one is the Chosen One, mm -hmm. destined destined to save the world or defeat the ult the ultimate villain. Um, mm -hmm. The orphaned protagonist again, Harry Potter. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, the wise old wizard. That's that that is Dumbledore and Dumbledore. and um, Gandalf. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but I prefer Gandalf. Mm -hmm. yeah, Gandalf at least knows how to, how to have fun when putting your life yes. in danger. <laughs> he, yes. a, he would throw a dwarf rave at your house, whereas, oh, whereas Dumbledore will warn you that the, uh, uh, the Forbidden Forest could kill you, that there's another tree down there that could kill you, and if you don't want to die a, a most painful death, just don't go to this floor corridor. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, whereas uh, Gandalf is like, here, here's some food, let's go kill a dragon. <laughs> Right. <laughs> oh god. Okay, quest to save the world. Yes. Yeah, that's your typical. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. one of my personal favorites, uh, the medieval setting. Yes. Yeah. And that's always fun because it doesn't matter when in medieval it is. They just plop you in the middle of medieval and go go. Yeah, exactly. Swords, uh, wizards, magic, you get, you name it. Um, yes. One of my favorites. Uh, medieval uh, 
her medieval fantasy shows is that literally just a medieval fantasy version of Star Wars. It's uh, The Legend of the Seeker. Does anyone here know that show? If not, then go watch it. You can find it on Amazon. It's fan flippin -tastic. It sounds really familiar. I had to look it up, but I, it sounds yeah. really familiar. It's only two seasons, but it's it's beautifully done. It's set in New Zealand. It, or not set okay. in New Zealand, but it's set in a fictional world. It's based on the book series. I think that it's called The Sword of Truth. Okay. And it's so much fun. They just have, they get all the tropes, all the fantasy, uh, fantasy tropes, all the medieval fantasy stuff, you name it. It's brilliant. And, and, and. Funny, fun, fun fact. The guy who plays Haldir, who uh -huh. um, who gets killed at the Battle of Helm's Deep, he okay. plays the villain. <gasps> oh. Yeah. Stop making oh. the villains dark and sexy! For crazy <laughs> stop, stop making us question our morals! Right? <laughs> We're supposed Talk to be the good morally. girls! Talk about morally gray, jeez. Yeah. Are, we the, like, are they the morally gray guys, or are we the morally gray for falling in love with them? 50 50 shot. Go, little yeah. column A, little column B. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, the evil Dark Lord villain. Ooh. Yeah. The ultimate evil Ooh. or villain that the protagonist must defeat in order to save the world. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, worst villain I ever saw. Have you ever um, seen Willow? No. <gasps> really? Uh -oh. Yeah, no. Girl! I'll put it on my list. You I'll put it on my list. <laughs> okay, the villainess, the sorceress in that movie, just god awful. She does such the, um, she does a separate stereotypical thing where she hears a prophecy about a baby that's gonna kill her, so she makes, uh, so she decides that she's going to take the baby and instead of yeeting it like the other villains do, she's going to send its spirit to an alternate dimension. Cause that's a normal reaction. Yeah. It's like, it's still alive in an alternate dimension, and if you yeah, send it really? there, there's a pathway for it to find its way back to you. That's what I'm saying. Like, that seems normal. This like, is normal. Thing. This is completely like, fine. Yeah, so the baby, she gets taken all the way across the world, or uh -huh. uh, she gets taken on a little journey throughout her short months of life. Oh. But no, no, she, she lives. But, spoiler alert, but uh, then Mad Mardigan, or not Mad Mardigan, that's actually the Val Kilmer's character. Val Kilmer's in this. He's fucking hilarious in this. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh my god, yeah. But this the, keeps getting better and better. <laughs> oh, it gets, it's terrible. This it's keeps great. getting better and it's better. It's great. <laughs> it's so much fun to watch. But the villain is, she sends her own daughter, um, who later becomes uh, Val Kimmer's wife, by the way, uh -huh. in real life and, and, and in, the, in the, the movie. It's her love interest. The typical enemies to lovers, but a terrible version of the trope. Anyways... I'll go into detail about that later. But she sends them, at, she, uh, the villainess sends her goons after the baby just so they can bring her back. That that way she can do the ritual. Because that's a normal response. I know. That's... I know. It's just like, did you learn nothing from like, I don't know. <laughs> no, nothing was learned. No, just terrible villain. Um, yeah. Going about. Um... But I seriously love this movie, even though it's a terrible, cheesy 80s fantasy. Mm hmm. But Val Kilmer is definitely one of the reasons to watch it. I mean, you literally see this man dress up in a dress. Yes. And that's how he meets his, uh, his love interest while he's dressed up as a woman. Yes. <laughs> I need to be in on this. I need to find this. You, you can find it on Amazon. I will, I will. I will be doing I, a lot of. You know what? It's we're supposed to get six or seven inches of snow tomorrow. I think I found what I'm doing tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, you okay? I will watch this movie with you yes. if you want because I, I need to see your reaction to some. Oh of my these gosh, reactions in real time. <laughs> yes. Okay. So wait, back to book tropes. Yes. Um, okay. Ooh, we got the magical hidden world. So Narnia. Ooh. I was gonna say Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Oh my gosh, I have the best story about Narnia. Tell it. <laughs> okay, so I was in college, right? Yeah. And the way that my college dorms were set up, it would be a dorm, a bathroom, and then a dorm. So we had suites. That's what they were called. They were called suites. Mm -hmm. 
So my college roommate and I, we, we both got through our junior and senior year together watching Angel and Smallville and watching Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and Prince Caspian. Yeah. And so our sweet mates moved out in the mm -hmm. middle of the first semester. Oh. So we renovated. <laughs> And we started putting our clothes in what was their closet. And we started making their beds into like couches and day beds. And we bought another rug and we decorated their room because there was nobody living in it. Mm -hmm. And we called it our spare room. <laughs> and we, we did pretty decent for, and we called the closet Narnia. Like we called the closet was Narnia. Yes. It was we flat out called it Narnia. <laughs> and we were we were fine. We were good. We were living life. Like we had the best dorm in campus because we literally took up the entire suite. Yes. Until until winter break rolled around. Dun dun dun. Because when winter break rolled around, we all got messages saying you have to take your mattresses off the bed frames because they would come in and they would clean the dorms, they would spray for bugs, all of that stuff, do the maintenance in the dorms while we were all gone. Mm -hmm. And so before anybody left, they had to pass room inspection. So the RAs would come around, they'd look in your room, they'd make sure you didn't have what you weren't supposed to, they'd pass you, you'd sign a thing, and they'd let you go home for winter break. Uh huh. And my RA knocks on our door and you didn't necessarily have to be there in or like we all knew the dates that the RAs would be coming around so you didn't necessarily have to be there because everybody was in class taking finals whatever mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't like go through every anybody's personal belongings or anything like it, like that it would just be a once over of the room to make sure there were no holes in the walls or anything like that I don't want to give anybody the impression that RAs were like, going through people's stuff mm -hmm. um, so the RA knocks on our door, comes in, looks through our room, and is like, good. We sign our paperwork. He knocks on the bathroom door. And I look at my roommate and I said, I don't know what he's knocking for. Nobody's in there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he's knocking for. He goes into the room next door, looks around, and goes, is nobody living in here? <laughs> and we just both looked at each other. We're like, no. And he goes, why are there clothes in the closet? Whose clothes are these? Are these yours? And we're like, kinda. He goes, were you treating this like a spare room? And we're like, yeah, kinda. He goes, how long have they been gone? And we're like, it's December. He's like, yeah. And we're like, mid-October? He's like, this, this room's been empty since mid-October? And you didn't think to tell anybody? <laughs> <laughs> he goes it's always you he goes to, he goes to us, it's always you two you two don't ever actually do anything wrong but when something weird happens on this floor it's always you two why is it when it, something ever happens it's always you two exactly <laughs> and so we just kind of looked at each other he goes I'm gonna pretend I didn't see this. Please <laughs> empty the closet. And now my smart ass goes, you mean Narnia? He looks at me and goes, you named the closet Narnia? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna forget I heard that. I'm yes. gonna forget what I saw. Make it all disappear before you guys go home for the winter. <laughs> so, we cleaned everything out. The two of us mumbling to each other. We had it so good. <laughs> yes. When we got back, there were two new people in there. We were like, damn. <laughs> damn it. We were so close. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's great. It was great. It was great. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. Oh, had to okay. had to take a side quest to tell that story because if you know like if you know me now you know how much that that actually tracks real well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, that's right. Um, <laughs> next <laughs> next trope. Um, yes. Prophecy. 
like uh, foretelling of events that will come true and often drives the plot. So like like in Willow, there's that um, the baby is eventually uh, she's destined to grow up and defeat the witch, the villain. Uh huh. So yeah, that's typical. Uh, that's your typical plot. It always starts when they're a baby. Yeah, always. Yeah, and then you got ooh the magical artifact or weapon, which is ooh. often a key component in the story's conflict. So uh-huh. okay, like Legend of the Seeker. So Richard, uh, he's the main character, or the, he mm-hmm. is the seeker, and he carries with him the Sword of Truth. Mm-hmm. And it's basically, it is a magical weapon and empowers him and his ability to fight and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And, um, however, if used wrong, if the if he is in a moment of anger, that sword also fuels his anger. And mm-hmm. it, that anger takes over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he could become, like, just as bad as the villains if he's not Oof. careful. Yeah. Oof. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're good. Then you got, uh, ooh, we got Dragon Monster Hunt. So, ooh. yeah, like like that dragon episode of uh, The Witcher. Yes. Uh, then you find out that the dragon was actually protecting a egg the whole time, and that he, one of the dragons was actually on the quest with them. Yeah. Yeah. And then, okay, you got Hogwarts <laughs> right here. Magical School Academy. This is actually a more common trope than you'd think. Mm-hmm. Because uh, you got Hogwarts, and then you got... Um, got so many books you got camp half blood uh let's see there's always some um academy especially like ooh vampire academy um, ooh yeah i only watched that movie that it was a fun watch but god i'm not i'm not that young anymore i can't <laughs> <laughs> i can't enjoy those movies as much as i could when i was younger right um, okay and here's one i just freaking hate the princess in distress ugh next Where please she- yeah. Oh, well, this one's my absolute favorite. The sidekick or comic relief character! Yes! So be, many of them. This would be my character if I was ever in a fantasy. I would be, yes, the, it co- would be. the sidekick comic relief character. The one always... And I just really want... I would absolutely love a story where the main character is the side character. Where they are the comic relief side character to the, hero, to the hero of the story, but it's from their point of view. You want me to write it? Yes, please. Okay. And I just done. give me at least one scene where they're like face to face with the hero's um, potential love interest or enemy to lover love interest, and just be like cross arms, like do you want to do you want her? You got to deal with me or something like that. <laughs> or better yet, have a scene where the you know, talk to the main character and be like, "Girl, you've been fucking stepping over this guy since the moment you laid eyes on him. Just get it over with already." I mean, I wouldn't put it in those words, but okay. Yeah, you got it. Give me some time. I got another. I've got a story for a mutual friend of ours to finish first. Okay, that's great. Uh, so let's see. Uh, the warrior race. The warrior race is like a uh, a tribe of um, of warriors. Like they'll be secretly living inside of a forest. They'll be well known for Your their prowess and their skill in battle. But they're always the revered type. Yeah, the re- the revered uh, you know uh, warrior race. Uh, let's see. Noble hero with a tragic past. Uh, ooh, a hero's journey, which is the um, uh, which is Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero of a Thousand Faces. I need to do an episode on that. Oh, here's one I absolutely love: mm-hmm. the ma- the magical creature companion. Oh, I love that. Yeah, for those of you who play D and D or uh, are a fan of like uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, uh, that's a familiar. Or even Hocus Pocus. Thanks. Yes. Binks was a familiar. Binks. As much as he didn't want to be. <laughs> yeah. Do you know how long? He was. Do you know how long it took me to realize that his name was Thackeray, like T H, instead of Zachary? Oh. Yeah. Oh. I grew up to that, and I know. it took me. I was. I didn't find out until like I was in my mid mid teens, early twenties. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Anyways. That's disappointing. So, yes. Ooh, here's a good one. Magical abilities that manifest suddenly. Sabrina. Sabrina the go. Teenage Witch. There you go. Because she doesn't get her powers until she's a teenager. That's the whole reason she gets sent to live with her aunt, so they can teach her how to use her powers. Mm-hmm. Oh, here's another good one. Mysterious ancient ruins or civilization. Hmm. So, like, oh, Game of Thrones. Uh, Valeria. Yes. Yeah, Valeria. Yes. Yeah. 
uh, the Chosen One's destiny. It's their destiny or fate, often tied to their status as the Chosen One. So Harry Potter, he's mm-hmm. destined to defeat Voldemort, but no one realizes how. Right. Yeah. Everyone just thinks that Harry probably, like, kills him, but what he has to do is, like, defeat the Horcruxes. Right. Yeah. So, ooh, unlikely group of heroes. This one's always fun. Yes. So, so if you ever played Dungeons and Dragons, this is like mm-hmm. the best example of it, especially if they're just a team of renegades. Yes. Oh god, have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons, Sammy? Yes, I played one round. I played a one-shot game once. Nice. Yeah. I've played I played D&D years ago. I've also watched uh, one of my favorite live streams um, uh, and podcast uh, D- uh, D&D discords. And... <laughs> My first game, I think, is my still is still my favorite. Um, I didn't actually know we were supposed to be playing. I was hanging out with a bunch of friends at my house, and um, my best friend at the time, he was a DM, and he arrived late. He brought the game with him. He didn't tell me that he was going to bring the game. He was actually discussing it with another friend who was coming over that day, mm-hmm. and they wanted to play it. So he brought the game over, and I'm like, oh, hey, how's it going? Wait, what do you have there? He's like, we're playing Dungeons and Dragons. I'm like, I don't know how to play that. What? How, what, how do you do this? And he says, yeah. Yeah, you're going to learn. I'll show you. So oh we, sit da- we sit down at the table and he gives out the character sheets. And I'm just staring at it for a good long while because I've never seen a D&D character sheet before. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Oh my gosh. Yeah. And uh, all the other, um, all the other uh, friends there, they were starting off, they were... Um, naming their characters, they were, uh, talking about their, um, they were talking about the characters, their classes, their weapons and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Oh, did, I, did, did my mic just cut out? No, 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 you cut out while you were talking about the tropes. Oh. But it was only for a couple minutes, so you didn't, you didn't Oh, for much. a couple of minutes? Yeah. Okay, so then I'll just, uh, find that and I'll cut it out, so. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, anyways. You'll um, be, you'll be able to cut it out. Like, you'll be able to fix it. Okay, good. So now I'll cut out this part afterwards as well. Anyways, so I, um, I was staring at the sheet, and everyone's going around the table talking about their characters, naming their characters' names and classes, their weaponry and whatnot, and my friend at the time, he, uh, was the DM, like I said, and he was playing a dwarf at the tavern where all the characters are gathering to, um, come together for the quest. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, he comes up to me and he says, and if you think my Irish accent is bad, his was worse. He did a Celtic accent for his character and he says, oh no. Yeah. He says, all right, who are you? What's your character? Oh no. And I said, I, I am a wizard <laughs> and I'm on a quest to find my father. And okay. Yeah. And he says, what happened? Did he run off with an elf? <sighs> and I said, uh, worse, he ran off with a dwarf. <laughs> the amount of shade that was in that response is great. I had completely forgotten in that moment that he was playing a dwarf. <laughs> Oops. So everyone else is giving everyone else at the table side eye, like, oh. Oh, crap. And then he just stares me down, and he's like, You got something against dwarves? Oops. That's what I remember. <laughs> that's when I just smile and I say maybe I don't like the idea of my father running away with a bearded woman oh my god yeah <laughs> his eyes started twitching <laughs> in character it's, it is always a great game when you can make the DM twitch like that <laughs> yep Oh, and I then, love it. Yeah, I played D&D, and, and then I also played um, a couple of games of uh, Call of Cthulhu. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was a librarian for that one. There you go. Yeah. Valerie Crooks. Ooh. I actually named that character after a person I met in real life by accident. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, but anyways, that's another story. Anyways. Yes. Uh, so... Enough with the tropes. Uh, let's get back to the actual podcast. Yes. Okay. I got. I think I got one last question for you. Okay. Um. One second. In the spirit of the podcast theme, 
What uh-huh. is what is the spiciest book you have ever read? So far, um, no. I was going to answer differently, but no. I have another answer. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a book that I found by accident one day while I was roaming Barnes and Noble. It's called A Worthy Opponent. Oh. Yes. And when I talked about this book on a TikTok live, I got my one and only violation. <laughs> um, what? How? I don't even know. I think somebody came in that didn't know me, took what I was saying out of context, and threw a report to TikTok. And I, my live immediately ended, and I got a violation notice, which I fought and won. Um, but it's, it's a very, it, it's a very dark book. I wouldn't classify it as dark romance. It's just a very dark book. It's Tinkerbell. She goes by Tink Mm -hmm. and she's working at this bar owned by Hades in a city that's run by Hades and as long as you're there he protects you for as long as you're there he protects you and you find out that she is hiding there from peter pan um because he's just not a nice person that's how i'm going to put it so we don't have to put trigger warnings and such on this um he's just not a nice person to her and she's trying to avoid him trying to avoid captain hook all of this jazz and captain hook wanders in one day flirts with her and then there's a shower scene <laughs> um is this steamy mm-hmm. literally and figuratively actually <laughs> um and being the peter pan lover that i am i literally read this book and i spent most of the book going oh my Oh no. Can can you do that? <laughs> Are you allowed to do this? Um Creative Liberty. Exactly. Um, but it was a very it's an okay written book. Um Is it you read it for the plot? Yes. Very much so. I read this one for the plot. But I but here's the thing, I didn't know that I was reading it for the plot until like the third chapter, then I was like, yep, there's no story here. Oh. <laughs> yep, nope, this story's gone. This is what we're looking for now. <laughs> yeah, that's how I felt about a touch of darkness. <laughs> ah, I can imagine. Um, and then of course there will always be chapter fifty-five. Eh. Okay, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me back this up, though. Let me show some work here that I think goes very overlooked about Chapter 55. Okay. If you read Chapter 54, in certain ways, Chapter 54 did more emotionally for me than 55 did. 55 gives you what you've been waiting for. You please throughout the entire book you're waiting for that scene to happen you're just like oh my gosh just do it already get a room and just do it already and that's what 55 served 54 explained how we got to 55 though explained how emotionally connected they were so that when you got to 55 Essentially, 55 did not need a trigger warning because of the events in Chapter 54. Mm. Because they had that very long conversation over soup, and you as the reader understand by the end of that conversation that they're no longer just talking about a meal. They're talking about the fact that Resand will only accept food cooked by a woman he respects and truly loves to his core that makes 55 make sense so is 55 well written and my god make us all look at paint differently (laughs) 
yeah. But 55 only makes sense if you understand the weight of what happens in 54. Hmm. If you look at it like that, 55 was written very well, and there's so much more behind the table and the paint and the wings. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, on its own, 55 is hot. Like, on its own, 55 is beautifully written, and let's face it, you read that chapter for the plot. Mm-hmm. But you don't get the emotional release of 55 if you don't understand the weight of 54. Because, I mean, at least for me, when I was reading it, there was a complete emotional release when that happened. Because I, you know, like, 54 wrecked me. Completely wrecked me. And I think that was one of the chapters that I reached out to a mutual friend of ours, and I said to them, I said, this book is destroying me. What the hell was 54? And I just get back, keep reading. (laughs) Keep reading. I was like, but that's not fair. And they were like, but you're about to hit 55. Keep reading. (laughs) And then once I got through 55, it was the emotional release from the buildup that 54 created. I think that if you're in <clears throat> if you're in the Akatar community and for those that are listening like if you have a counter thought to this please let me know. I am very much so open for doing this, but I have been dying to have this Akatar talk of 54 and 55 for the longest freaking time. So during 54 when she's cooking his soup and they're literally unloading their trauma onto each other not in a way of I want you to fix this but in a way of I need you to understand where my emotional trauma is coming from because I trust you because I need you to know this in order for us to move forward we'll never talk about this trauma again but we have to talk about this because until that moment the two of them did not open up to each other like that at all like at all it was just side glances and hugs and shared champagne and hey let's get you out of this room and that way we can you know be alone together and i can pin you against a wall and we can make out for a little while And that's all that the relationship really was for a while. You know, there was, he he taught her to read. He taught her how to read minds. He was a teacher for a while. He is her mate. He loves her to the ends of the earth. And that kind of love that they describe in especially the third book, no, second book, I'm sorry, especially in the second book, is like a faded kind of hot and heavy love that neither of them can actually deny being in. 54 gave them the the real-world groundwork that they needed to do to make sure that they were going to make it as a couple not just as a power couple as the high lady and high lord of the of the you know night court you know it was this real world deep rooted we need to have this conversation so that we understand where we're both coming from to earn each other's trust, real trust, not just I'm going to get you out of this situation or I'm going to let you put your hand on my boob during this meeting with everybody to show that you have power, but actual real world groundwork to make sure that their relationship works. And once that happens, The emotional release that you get from chapter 55 
is actually more satisfying than reading what happens between the paint and the table and the two of them. If you really sit and think about it, at least for me. I'm gonna have to reread the book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could have been internalizing it too much. I don't know if I, that was, you know, if no, I wasn't, no. sub, you know. No, that was brilliant. Um, I love that. But the, yeah, but that's that's how I saw Fifty Four because Fifty Four messed me up. After I read Fifty Four, I had to put that book down for like a week before I read Fifty Five because it was just that kind of conversation where I said to myself that's the kind of conversation I want to have with somebody. Not for purposes of dating or anything like that, you know, but for the purposes of this is why I am why I am. Take me or leave me. This is why I am the way I am. And if I'm telling you about my trauma, it's because I trust you. Because that's the only reason the two of them opened up to each other like that. Because they trusted each other absolutely implicitly with each other and that made 55 an, an emotional release and it was lovely what she did with those two chapters yeah just yeah, my take on it <laughs> just my take on it no, it's a really that, great take i like it that got deep real quick <laughs> no, hey, hey yeah, no, no. this is one of the reasons that we love these books and we get so invested in them because we have, right. a pers we have a personal investment in it, an emotional one, and that's why um, that's why we read them. We don't just read it for the plot. We read right. it because uh, we resonate with the characters, or we get emotionally attached to them because we love it. We love the story. We love the characters. We love uh, their development, and we and aside from that, all that we also love the romance. You know, we love Ex how they develop those relationships. Exactly. But at the same time, 54 is why I can never look at somebody and go, I hate Feyre. Because I don't. I like her. Mm -hmm. I like her a lot. I like her because she was able to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Because he's the only one she... He, she doesn't even have that kind of conversation with Tamlin. No. She does not let him in that far. But she lets Reese in that far. And as flawed as Feyre is, as whiny as she can be. As immature as she can as be. As immature as she can be. I will never look at anybody and say, I can't stand Feyre. Because of the conversation in chapter 54 of the second book. I have, I walked away from 54 going, yeah, no, this tracks. I saw too much of myself in her to ever walk away from that character now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I never, she annoyed the hell out of me at certain points, especially right. when it came to her immaturity. Mm -hmm. But she wasn't a despicable character. The only character that drove me absolutely nuts, besides Tamlin in the book yeah. two, yeah. was Elaine. Oh my gosh, so much. <laughs> oh my gosh, just make her stop. <laughs> I, just... I went through the entire first book of Make Her Stop. Just shake a can of pennies at her. Make I'm her sorry. stop. You, I'm sorry, she didn't know that she was capable of helping? I, I know. I know. She could. She loved growing things. She did. She couldn't have grown a fucking potato? <laughs> like, if you want to live in order right? another day to grow another flower... You might want to grow the substance in order to need in order you need in order to live the next That's day. That's what I'm saying. But it's no, just, we're gonna we're no, gonna sit no on the couch and we're gonna sit on the couch and bitch about the fact that we don't have new shoes and a new coat instead. Mm. I know. I know. Just a spoiled little princess, and she totally with was. With no standards, no None. fucking standards. The, the guy that she was supposed to marry straight up tells her he doesn't want her, right? And she's still pining after him like <sighs> that. Like, I girl! Swear. I Back mean, to that damsel in distress crap. I get it. I get that she went through a horrible ordeal, and I get yes. that she, uh, like, her whole life was upended. Yes. But, girl! Come yes. on! She, she should have been the one to smack his fucking face. Oh, please. I know. 
I mean, Nesta was standing up for her. Uh, and even I Nesta, know. yeah. I don't even care about the rejection of the uh, bond with Lucian. That no. was that was not even that should never have been a part of the story. I'm sorry. That no. was drama. That was drama for the sake of drama. It was. I I, <laughs> I remember getting to that part and going, "You really pulled that out of the sky, didn't you?" Yeah. Like well, no, you. She pulled, you no, she pulled that out of the sky. No, she pulled it out of her ass. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Anyways, respectfully. Anyway. Yes. Anyways. Anyway. So, but, you know, let's get back to the ending of the podcast, because yeah. we went on a, on a major side quest. We went on some time. side quests, but that's okay. That's what we do. Yeah. So, spiciest book you ever read. Um, you said that was the hook book. Yes. And you are about to read one of the spiciest books I have ever read. Or you're, yes. you're starting it. I am. Yeah. I am. I'm excited to start this thing. Like I said, this book doesn't even need a plot. <laughs> no, I, I got that from the prologue. I'm like, yeah, we're gonna... <laughs> this doesn't need any actual words. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's still very enjoyable. And um, yeah, like I said, it makes chapter 55 look very mild in comparison. Oh, nice. Yeah. We'll have to see about that. This made another mutual mutual friend of ours blush. Oh my gosh! Yeah. <laughs> every time friend. I go to every time I go to our mutual friends while I'm having emotional moments during books, all I get back is keep reading. <laughs> I From got both that. of them. From both of them, actually, they both told me. <laughs> they both told me to keep reading. I said, "What are you two conspiring against me now?" No, I got that for three of our mutual friends. Uh, one of them was for the Touch of Darkness series, and okay. when I was complaining about a trope that's starting up in the second book. Okay. When I was reading Akatar for the first time, uh-huh. I remember texting uh, a mutual friend at like one o'clock in the morning. And <laughs> the first book I read, I was like, "Oh, I mean, I just met Lucian. I like this guy." And oh they ju- they get a smiley face, keep reading. Nice. Um, by the time we get to the second book, I'm actually like typing out in all caps, "What the fuck is wrong with Tamlin?" <laughs> <laughs> Favor. Why is he being? Why is he coddling her? Why is he overprotecting her? She doesn't need protection. Right. Okay. She she was kicking ass when she was still a human. Yep. What 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 is this? Yep. And then I get the silver flames and I say, oh, I'm at this part of the book. And he says, oh, I'm actually not. Um, I'm actually I haven't read that book yet. Oops. And I'm like. Oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry! I'm, like, <laughs> I'm going on and on and on. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to spoil that for Oopsies. you. <laughs> and I was laughing my ass off at like oh, 10 no. o'clock in the morning. Oh no. Uh, thank All God right. it was the tw- uh, the one to tw- the one to ten shifts I was working back then. Oh there you go. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, the keep reading very well and familiar with that phrase. Yes. Just keep reading. Like, remind me really? to embroider remind me to embroider a pillow that just says keep reading. You got it. <laughs> You'll get the first one. Yes. Yeah. On that note, uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today on this episode. Sammy, thank you yes. for joining he- me to- me today. I really love and appreciate you for coming on. Always. Yeah. And dear listener, if you could please like, comment, and share this podcast, let us know how you liked this episode in the Discord. And if you have any book recommendations or you yourself would or you yourself would like to come on as a guest, shoot us a DM or an email at I read it for the podcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. I hope you enjoyed this episode almost as much as the book you are currently reading. Stay safe and have a wonderful day. Till next time.